Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and I don't know if you feel a little overwhelmed at times studying the Old Testament. I think there's times when I think it feels a little bit deep, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to fully comprehend everything that I read, so I sometimes think I'm going to need help, and I'm so lucky we have help today because we're going to talk about the book that's between Daniel and Lamentations. Do you even know what that book is? is the book of Ezekiel. Now, to me, Ezekiel is this fascinating book that I, unfortunately, have not studied as much as I should have. And I think it's going to be outstanding to spend time with Pastor Andy Davis today to talk about the book of Ezekiel. He told stories with a lot of symbolic meanings, and he performed symbolic actions and described extraordinary visions that he had received. And the book of Ezekiel organizes these messages into pretty much three main parts. And I know Andy, after having preached on this subject, uh, the book of Ezekiel, not only has he preached on it, he memorized the entire book, which just puts him in a completely different category. But um, I'm looking forward to having a conversation with him. And I don't know, I think he's ready. Andy is uh, is here. Andy, welcome. Bill, it's great to be with you. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Well, I was just giving my audience a little heads up, and I was saying we're going to be talking about the book between Daniel and Lamentations, and I wonder if a lot of people were scratching their heads going, I don't know what that is. What do you think? Well, I'm excited. Ezekiel is an incredible world to explore, and we're going to just touch on some of its themes. That's all we can do in the time we have. Yeah, I know, and I appreciate that. I, I think you did a extensive preaching on it at your church, didn't you? Yeah, I, I preach, but I, as you mentioned, the number one thing was just memorizing it and just walking through and um, just, uh, you know, it took me about a year and a half and it was a very hard book to memorize, but just a lot of insights that came and it was a great time. Uh-huh. All right, let's uh, let's jump in. I know we're going to only have an hour, so uh, I want you to uh, lead us in this discussion because yeah. uh, you're, uh, you're an incredibly gifted communicator, and I want to say maybe we should just start with um, maybe a 30,000-foot view as we get started. Yeah, okay, so Ezekiel was uh, a, a priest in the priestly uh, family, and he was in exile in the first wave of exile of the Babylonian exiles, and uh, he was given a ministry in, in basically kind of two parts, uh, ministering to the exiles uh, that were with him and also somewhat to the people still back in Jerusalem, letting them know of the great wickedness and sins of the nation of Israel that prompted the exile and the destruction of the temple, how vital it was for them to understand that, but then also to give promises, God's promises of future restoration. So that's kind of the two basic parts of Ezekiel's ministry. Mm-hmm. All right, as we try to break this down, um, let's talk about chapter one, and we're going to try to go through this as as quickly as we can. Um, I I don't want to race through it, but let's talk about uh, chapter one of Ezekiel, and and maybe, Andy, you can explain how this chapter displays the infinite glory of God, and and how do you see it also as a a vision of the pre-incarnate Christ? Yeah, I love Ezekiel one. What an incredible chapter it is and it really shows the limitations of language like how would you possibly put such an overwhelming vision into language but through the inspiration of the holy spirit he did that and it's ezekiel's call similar to isaiah 6 where isaiah was called into the prophetic ministry and so he has a vision of the glory of god and it comes uh first of all with these incredible spirit beings called cherubim Mm -hmm. that are described in this incredible way but uh he sees a windstorm coming out of the north it says an immense cloud with flashing lightning surrounded by brilliant light and the center of the fire looked like glowing metal and in that fire in the midst of that fire is what looked like four living creatures and bill one of the insights i had as i memorized ezekiel is these living creatures seem completely at home in that fire wow Uh, they're in the in the midst of 
of brilliant light and heat and fire, and it seems to be their native habitat. Now, later, um, they're going to be commanded to take some of that fire and drop it like a bombing raid on the city of Jerusalem. So it, it occurred to me that the fire must represent the holiness of God, and they themselves are holy angels. They're holy cherubim, and they're comfortable and at home in the holiness, but the wicked city of Jerusalem would be destroyed by that holiness of God. At any rate, in that vision, these cherubim are moving back and forth like uh, with, with tremendous speed, like flashes of lightning. And the author of the Hebrews describes angels like, like torches and like flashes of lightning. There's this like winds, uh, angels move quickly. And so these uh, angelic, these cherubim uh, uh, are moving back and forth. They're wheels within wheels, giving a sense of mobility. And, and it's an awesome vision. But the thing that struck me the most of all uh, over uh, over everything was this expanse that separated the cherubim uh, was a high above their heads, like a, kind of like a boundary or something, like sparkling like ice. And high above that was a throne and someone seated on it. And the individual that looked like it, uh, that was seated on the throne, uh, is described as if he looked like a man. Um, a figure like that of a man, it says in verse 26 of chapter 1. And, and But he himself is radiantly glorious. I saw that what appeared to be from his waist up, he looked like glowing metal as if full of fire. And from there down, he looked like fire and brilliant light surrounded him. Uh, this, in my opinion, must be the pre-incarnate Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a picture of Christ enthroned with the glory that, you know, Jesus prays in John 17, Father, give me that glory I had with you before the world began. And so here's this radiant glory, and the cherubim are far below him, and they can't get near him in that sense because he is alone in his glory. And so it just gives you that sense of the holiness of God being separation. He, the creator, and they, the creatures, there's an infinite gap. And it says this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So it actually isn't even the full glory of the Lord because no one could see that and survive. And he says, when I saw it, I fell face down and I heard the voice of one speaking. So it's just an awesome first chapter. It's an incredible first chapter. And Andy, even the language that's used, I sometimes, I, I'm, I struggle to try to imagine what I'm reading and how I can, how I can put this into my brain. Um, you, you've done a great job of explaining it, but some of the descriptions in like the f chapter uh, one verses 15 to 18, it's mm -hmm. just amazing. They sparkled like chrysolite and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. I'm just trying to put this in my mind and it's not easy. Yep. No, it's hard to do. And we know in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, now we see through a glass darkly, then face to face. And then he says, also, when I was a child, I thought like a child, talk like, like a child, reason like a child. That, to me, is the ministry of the word. It's almost like so much childish babble compared to what it will be like when we see the glory of God face to face, how awesome that will be. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about Ezekiel. Uh, what? Let's talk about his call as a prophet. And what is that yeah. what what is that teaching us about the ministry of the word of God, Andy? Yeah. So fundamentally, Christianity is a is a revealed religion. The Bible is a book of revelation. It's a book of God revealing truth to the human race through the prophetic ministry. And so Ezekiel is one of those men specially called by God to deliver truth uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit and he was called by God to be a prophet. You don't take that honor on yourself. It has to be given by God. And so he was called. And, uh, you know, at the end of chapter one, he says, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down and I heard the voice of one speaking. And so sometimes the chapter divisions aren't, aren't all that helpful. We, we go right from that into uh, this call. And he says, son of man, stand up on your feet and I will speak to you. And he says, when I, when he spoke, the spirit came into me and raised me to my feet and I heard him speaking to me. So this is the ministry of the Spirit on him. Mm -hmm. And by the Spirit of God, the prophets were enabled to speak a perfect word to the Jewish nation, uh, free from any error. And he was called by God to say these things. And then God says this to him. He says, son of man, that's what he called Ezekiel. That was his name again and again. It's very familiar to us as Christians because that was Jesus' favorite title for himself son of man, but he calls Ezekiel the prophet, son of man. He says, I'm sending you to the Israelites to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. 
And he says, I'm going to send them, I'm going to send you to an obstinate and stubborn people. (laughs) And you're going to say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen to you or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And he says, don't be afraid of them. I'm going to make you um, powerful around them, despite the fact that they are like scorpions around you and, and, and hate you and are angry at you. And so I want you to say these things to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. So what does this teach me about the Word of God? First of all, it's divine origin. It comes from God through the Holy Spirit to the human race through prophets like Ezekiel. Um, It was by the Spirit that he spoke. And also, the role of a prophet is to deliver the message, whether it's popular or not, whether the people listen or not. Mm -hmm. His job is to deliver the Word of God. Mm -hmm. So good. Dr. Andy Davis is my guest. He's the senior pastor of First Baptist Church of Durham, North Carolina. We're talking today about uh, the book of Ezekiel. And as we talk about, Andy, the, the, the wickedness of Israel, maybe you would share about um, the display that that the wickedness of Israel that that really brought on the exile to Babylon. Yeah, it's a big theme, and uh, it's very, very uh, devastating. Um, and it was very convicting for me, Bill, honestly, and we can talk about that more in, in some of the later sections. But um, one of the things that I've learned to do, and when I read the Bible, you know the parable that Jesus told of the uh, the Pharisee and the tax collector, And, you know, the Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. You know, I'm not like this. I'm not like, I thank you that I'm such a good man kind of thing. And uh, I've just learned that that is very displeasing to God. And when I read something that's very convicting in the Bible, I always desire to stand under that conviction and to not say, God, I thank you that I'm not like that sinful nation that rebelled in those ways, but instead to see the sin in my own life. But it's very, very tragic what's going on here, because you've got this incredible temple that Solomon built, and it's radiant and glorious and and covered with gold, and it was just an incredible structure. And it was the center of of um, religion for the people of God, for the Jewish nation. And they were commanded in the laws of Moses to come there and to assemble there and to offer their sacrifices there. But God was about to destroy it. Mm -hmm. And so in order to explain that, because in Jeremiah's day, and Jeremiah was uh, just a little bit before this time in a contemporary, they were trusting in the temple of the Lord that God would never, ever allow any Gentile nation to destroy the temple. But that was exactly what he was about to do. And so in Ezekiel 8, uh, he has a vision of a man coming to him mm-hmm. and a glorious man who looks like he's he's burning with fire mm-hmm. and he stretched out what looked like a hand and he took Ezekiel by the hair of his head in his vision <laughs> and yeah. and he carried him he says the spirit took me uh between earth and heaven and wow. in visions of God he took me back to Jerusalem so he goes back to Jerusalem to the temple and when he gets there he sees in in Ezekiel 8 layer upon layer of idolatry and corruption and wickedness. He is commanded at one point in the vision, it's like a participatory vision, to dig through a wall, and there he sees the elders of Israel worshiping all kinds of idols and creepy, crawly things and and nasty creatures, and they're worshiping in the temple grounds this great wickedness and this corruption. And God says to uh, Ezekiel, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of do uh, of of the house of Israel are doing in the darkness, each in the shrine of his own idol? You know, so this is something they're doing privately, personally, but also they were doing it collectively, even in the temple grounds. And so, in in chapter eight, he's just giving a a, a clear vision of the great wickedness of what should have been the holiest place in Israel. Then in chapter 9, there's this terrifying sense of angels that come, and these angels are called the guardians of the city, and they come each with a deadly weapon in his hand. And Mm -hmm. then there's another angel that has a writing kit, um, and the the angel with the writing kit is called to go throughout the entire city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the 
foreheads of those who grieve and lament over the idolatry and wickedness of the city. These are the true believers. Wow. And so he does that. And then the others, the six others who have the weapons at their side, are told to follow that man and kill everyone in the city. Uh, old men, young men and maidens, women and children, anyone who does not have the mark, slaughter them all, but do not touch anyone with the mark. And then the first man comes back after being gone just a short time. And so the implication is there are really not many there in Jerusalem who are genuine believers of the true God and who are grieving over the idolatry. And so there was this terrifying vision of the impending doom of most of the citizens of Jerusalem. And then in chapter 10, we have this very sad um, vision of the glory of God, which had entered the temple when Solomon dedicated it, this mm -hmm. glory cloud. The same thing happened when Moses dedicated the tabernacle. The glory cloud, the, the presence of God, the dwelling cloud, it's called the Shekinah glory, the dwelling glory of God, that cloud moved up and out of the temple, moved to the threshold and eventually moved out of the city, meaning the glory of God is gone. And now the temple is nothing more than a pile of stones about ready to be destroyed. Well, Andy, you really understand this. <laughs> this is so fascinating. We are talking to Dr. Andy Davis, and we are in the book of Ezekiel today. If you have a question and you'd like to uh, ask Andy, uh, please text it over, 877-933-2484. We'll be right back. Hi, podcast listener. You know, I'm Bill Arnold, and my theme song says, What's for Dinner?, and like when I'm grilling, I'm paying really close attention. And I know that ideal second to get the food off the grill. Like all good and ideal timings in life, right now would be an ideal time to be a cheerful giver to Faith Radio. Give now to support this podcast so that more people in more places might come to saving faith in Jesus and grow in their relationship and become a fully devoted follower. Click the link in the show notes or give now at My Faith Radio. Com. So glad I have Dr. Andy Davis with me today, and we're talking about the book of Ezekiel. I asked him to talk about it, and he said yes, so here we are. Uh, Andy, as I'm looking in chapter 10, verses 18 and 19, then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. While I watched, the cherubim spread their wings and rose from the ground and mm -hmm. as they went, the wheels went with them. They stopped at the entrance mm -hmm. to the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory mm -hmm. of, of God of Israel was above them. So uh, my question is, talk, talk about the significance of the glory of God departing from the temple. Well, it's it's really a powerful image. Uh, the glory of God, this glory cloud, or, or the sense of the glory of God, represents his active presence and his pleasure in the temple and his desire to meet with his people there and that it would be holy ground similar to the burning bush mm -hmm. uh, where he god told moses take off your sandals for the ground on which you're standing is holy ground now how do we understand that if we believe in an omnipresent god uh, omnipresent means god's equally in every place all the time uh, it has to do with, I think, God's desire to reveal his glory um, to um, the people in that location. And by the glory cloud moving, it means he's not going to be there in any special way anymore. It mm -hmm. is literally just, just one more location now. There's nothing special about it. And therefore, the door is open, sadly for Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian troops to come in and literally destroy it, just chop it down, burn it, to the, strip it of the gold, just take it to the ground. And that's exactly what they're going to do. Okay. Let's uh, move on to chapter 16 and yeah. uh, talk about, if you would, Andy, how this, this chapter, how did it speak to you? I know you've memorized the entire book of Ezekiel, but in 16, yeah. we learn about God's faithless bride. And how did this chapter speak to you as a, as a sinner saved by grace? Yeah, it is. It it very. It has been very emotional for me. It's a, it's a long chapter, uh, sixty three verses, and and it's an allegory um, in which God likens uh, the city of Jerusalem uh, to a faithless bride, mm -hmm. and we know that that all um, all um, 
Uh, marriage, like Christian marriage in Ephesians 5, is a picture of Christ and the church. We have the church portrayed as the bride of Christ, um, and we have uh, this this image. And then in the Old Testament, sadly, uh, Israel is portrayed as an unfaithful bride. Like, for example, the prophet Hosea is told to marry a uh, and a prostitute, Gomer, mm-hmm. and that pictures God's marriage to Israel. Well, Ezekiel 16 is very much like that message of the book of Hosea, very much. Um, and so it's an allegory in which God says that he saw Israel as a young baby, as a newborn baby, sorry, uh, cast out in her blood, kicking about in her blood. Um, you know, it was just exposed that the, the, uh, the uh, uh, hang on a second. My phone's ringing. That's sorry, okay. Just, just make sure you don't take it. Sorry. <laughs> um, I got you. So, first. I, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. So, um, as he, as he passes by, he says to this baby that would have died, like human babies are completely helpless after birth. And, mm-hmm. and so, uh, he said, live and then saw to her living. And then she grew and went through puberty and became, uh, old enough to, to be married. And the Lord saw that she was old enough to be married. And he says, I spread the corner of my garment over you. And, um, I, uh, spread the corner of my garment over you and entered entered into a covenant with you and you became mine. Um, and that's just a very, very powerful image. Um, he married her and then he made her beautiful. He gave her uh, clothing, sandals, a crown for her head, jewels for her arms and her neck, um, and then the best food to eat and everything. And she became magnificent in her beauty. But she used her beauty to become a prostitute. He says in verse 15, you trusted in your beauty and used your fame to become a prostitute. You lavished your favors on anyone who passed by and your beauty became his. And so as a result, he then turns in a jealous wrath against Jerusalem and says, I'm going to bring on you the punishment of an unfaithful wife. I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to bring warriors against you. So it's an allegory. Mm -hmm. So it goes from being a woman to being the city, a city. And I'm, I'm going to bring warriors who will destroy you to the ground because of your unfaithfulness. So, Bill, as I was reading this, it just occurred to me, um, not for the first time, but in a very poignant way, how God is a jealous God, and anything that we love more than we love him is an idol. Anything in this universe that we love more than God is an idol, and we have that tendency. We have that that idolatrous, wandering heart, and I was convicted again and again, because my pattern is to memorize three verses a day, and then to say those verses for a hundred consecutive days, and then stop saying them. So that's how I moved through the whole book. I, I never was able to recite the entire book of Ezekiel at once, but just moved through about 300 verses at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how I learned it. So I had about, you know, three months plus of going over Ezekiel 16 every day Wow! and being convicted every day. And at the end of the, um, at the end of that, uh, that time, I, uh, you know, at the end of that meditation, I was captivated at the end where it says, then when I make atonement for all your sins, um, you will re- remember and be ashamed of all the things you've done and never again open your mouth because of your sinfulness. So that's Ezekiel 16, 63. Mm-hmm. So that spoke to me of a, a present shamefulness that we should all have concerning our sins and a, hum- a humility that we should have and, and uh, a meekness because we know that we are sinners saved by grace. Now, I know that God has forgiven our sins completely as far as the East is from the West, mm-hmm. but still there's that sense of being genuinely humbled before God. And so that's what Ezekiel 16 did for me. That's so interesting. Uh, yeah. Pastor Andy Davis is my guest. We're in the book of Ezekiel. And Andy, as I look at chapter 17, I start to see the a great eagle with powerful wings, long feathers, and full plumage of varied colors came to Lebanon, taking hold of the top of a cedar. As it goes through this, it really talks about the, the parable of these two eagles and the vine. And 
is this a reference to God humbling the Jewish nation? Yeah, this is a very powerful and a complex image, and it was it was really, really important. Um, as I understood just the subsequent history of the nation of Israel after the exile. And so basically the image is that God is intending to keep the nation of Israel post-exile low mm -hmm. and humble and subservient to Gentile overlords. And it is what Jesus called the times of the Gentiles. So that basically uh, Gentile powers are in charge of the nation of Israel from the exile of Babylon on. And at one point, they try, in Ezekiel uh, 17, they try to get up and out of that and make an alliance of their own and basically rebel against the king of Babylon and uh, to try to make their own way in the world and to try to regain control over the promised land and all that. And God will not have it. And he's actually very angry at them for breaking their oath to the king of Babylon. They, he is absolutely upholding the king of Babylon's authority over the exiles and over the remnant that's still back in the promised land. Uh, and, and it's something that's very, very hard for nationalistic and religious Jewish people to accept. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something that continued on into Jesus' day where they were extremely, and beyond into the, into the book of Acts, extremely angry about the Roman authority over Jerusalem and wanted, wanted the kingdom restored and, and were yearning for that. But God uh, pictures Israel as a low kind of creeping vine, uh, not some massive tree. So it's a matter of humility. But what's so fascinating, at the end of the chapter in Ezekiel 17, he gives a direct prophecy of the kingdom of Christ coming along. And that's where the exaltation of Israel is going to come. Uh, he says at the end of the chapter, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will take a shoot from the very top of a cedar and plant it. I will break off a tender sprig from its topmost shoots and plant it on a high and lofty mountain. That's Mount Zion. That's Jerusalem. On the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. It will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. All the trees of the field will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and make the low tree grow tall. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. Now, as I read this, I thought, wow, this is definitely a picture of the kingdom of Christ. Because you remember Jesus told the parable of the mustard seed. Mm -hmm. And he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows... It is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that what? The birds of the air will come and perch in its branches. That's the very language that's used of this kind of transplanted new kingdom that's going to grow in the, uh, on the heights of Mount Zion. So that's a, an incredible picture. So what does it say to me? It says to me that um, post-exile, before the second coming of Christ, there's a humbling to the Jewish nation and a humbling to the city of Jerusalem, that what Jesus calls the times of the Gentiles. But the future glory of Israel will be in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. All right, Andy, when we come back from a short break, I want to ask you about Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23. And it says, Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? Now, when I come back, I want to ask you about what this chapter is going to teach us about God's justice in dealing with individual sinners. Dr. Andy Davis is my guest. We are in the book of Ezekiel today. If you have a question or comment, send it over 877-933-2484. Pastor Dr. Andy Davis is my guest. He is the senior pastor of First Baptist Church of Durham, North Carolina. He's also the founder of Two Journeys Ministry. You can head to twojourneys.org. You will get a, an immense amount of amazing teaching there. So twojourneys.org. All right. 
Andy, right before the break, I was talking about Ezekiel 18. In verse 23, it says, Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? So let's talk about chapter 18 and what it teaches us about God's justice in dealing with individual sinners. Yeah, so the chapter begins with a a proverb that was running around in Ezekiel's day. Keep in mind, these are massive times. Uh, The exile started. um, There's all kinds of, you know, judgment, everything going on. And so that generation was saying uh, by this proverb, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, we're getting punished for our ancestors' sins. Um, And God is very angry about that that uh parable he says it's just not true the soul who sins will die i hold each each sinner accountable for the decisions that that they make each one Mm -hmm. and so you sin you die now the wages of sin is death but also the chapter speaks of god's patience and his yearning for sinners to repent and turn from their evil ways but also conversely the necessity of righteous people to continue to live righteously and not do a negative turn, uh, like a anti-repentance, where they turn away from righteousness and start doing evil things. Because fundamentally, God wants righteous people to continue to be righteous and wicked people to repent and start living uh, a righteous life. The soul who sins is the one who will die. And, and he says, fundamentally, I take no joy in you know, killing sinners. I have no joy in the death of the wicked. Rather, what I delight in is when they turn from their evil ways and live. This reminds me, of course, of Luke 15, the three cycles of parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the prodigal son. And Mm -hmm. all three have to do with God's delight, the way he celebrates when a sinner will turn from sin and through repentance and in faith in Christ, find salvation. That brings tremendous joy Conversely, we see Jesus weeping over Jerusalem because he knows that judgment through the Romans is going to come because of their great sin and wickedness. And so one of the great mysteries of the Bible is how God is absolutely sovereign over all of the events that happen on earth. And yet people are completely responsible for their choices and God grieves over bad choices. He weeps over the wicked choices that sinners make and yearns that they turn from their evil ways and live. Mm -hmm. So, Andy, in chapter 20 of Ezekiel, we are reminded of Israel's tragic history of idolatry. Maybe you would talk about some insight you might have about uh, what we can learn from this chapter. Yeah, this was an amazing discovery for me. And basically, he's going back over the history of Israel from the start, the beginning of his relationship. He said, you've always been the same. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you're idolatrous. You're, you're idolatrous straight through every generation. You're always the same. And so he rehearses the history. Now, what was new for me, Bill, was in, in Ezekiel 25 through 10, he begins the history with the nation in slavery in Egypt. They're in bondage in Egypt. And God warned them to turn from their idolatrous ways, which they had learned that idolatry from the Egyptians. They'd become basically like Egyptian-style pagans while they were slaves in, in Egypt. And so God warned them to turn from their idolatry before he ever led them out of Egypt. But they refused to do it. And God said, I wanted to kill you, but for the sake of my name, I let you live. And then I led you out of Egypt through Moses and Aaron and the Exodus. Now, What's amazing to me is none of that is recorded in the book of Exodus. That that warning to turn from their idolatry, lest God should destroy them while they were still slaves, mm. is a new insight. And it just shows how God sometimes circles back and gives new information on some things that we didn't know about through a later prophet. Uh, it also shows how somebody can be oppressed uh, under great tyranny, but still sinful, and worthy of death because of their own sins and their own idolatry. There aren't any innocent people. There are oppressors and there are oppressed. But if we have idolatrous hearts, we're still under judgment no matter what side of that equation we're on. So that was chapter 20. Okay. I'm going to jump up to chapter 28. Um, We still have a bunch of chapters to go through, but let's talk about um, what what are we learning about Satan in this chapter? 
Well, Ezekiel 28 is one of the two great images uh, that theologians have found of Satan and of the fall of Satan, and the other is in Isaiah 14. And Isaiah 14 is the great Lucifer passage in the KJV, how you have fallen from heaven, mm -hmm. O morning star, or Lucifer, son of the dawn. And, and Isaiah 14 uh, pictures uh, Satan um, a s s desiring to topple God from his throne, the throne of his glory. He said, I will ascend. I will make myself like the most high. But he gets cast down. So that's the son, uh, the, sorry, the, uh, the king of Babylon image that he has uh, there. Here we have the king of Tyre. And, the, and Tyre was a port city uh, that was uh, a merchant city, a prosperous city, a city of merchants that traveled all over the Mediterranean and became overwhelmingly wealthy. But the king of Tyre is portrayed in language that soars above any human king, similar to the king of Babylon image in Isaiah 14. And so he says in a very powerful way, um, you were the model, he says, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says, you were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone adorned you, ruby, topaz, and emerald, chrysolite, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold on the day you were created, so they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub. For so I ordained you. That word cherub is similar to the cherub, cherubim is the plural of it, that we saw in Ezekiel 1 in that first vision and, and some later visions as well. So it's an angel, a guardian cherub. For so I ordained you. You are on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. So let's just stop for a moment. This language is far greater than anything that could be said of any human king. Mm-hmm. So therefore, this is the kind of king of merchandise, the king of commerce, uh, king of Tyre, but he's portrayed as having existed back when in the Garden of Eden and walking among the, the stones on the, on the mountain of God. And so the key moment here is it says you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created Till wickedness was found in you. This is the great mystery, the unanswerable question of mm -hmm. theology is where did evil come from? And there it is right there in 2815, right in the heart of Satan, I believe. Uh, he became proud, it, we're told, on account of his beauty. Uh, in verse 17, your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. That's the exact same language in the Lucifer wow. pas uh, passage and also in um, Revelation 12, how God basically threw Satan to the earth. Mm -hmm. And then in the book of Job, he says, where have you come from, Satan? You know, he says, from roaming back and forth in the earth. So, you know, that is the fall of Satan. What's interesting is the king of Babylon is a military uh, leader and the king of Tyre is a merchant leader. And so you just look at whatever nation is most powerful militarily and whatever nation is most uh, prosperous economically, we can see the hand of Satan behind both of those. That is the world. That's the power of the world. And uh, in both cases, God is sovereign over Satan. So it's just a very powerful chapter, Ezekiel 28. Boy, is it ever. Pastor Andy Davis is my guest. We are in the book of Ezekiel today. When I get to chapter 36, Andy, in it has got one of the greatest prophecies in the Old Testament about the glories of the new covenant. Would you explain that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I've quoted this, I think, probably countless times in sermons. And here God uh, is promising restoration for Israel, but in language that extends into the new covenant. And um, he says, first of all, concerning the nation, he says, I'm going to show you the holiness of my great name which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them, then the nations will know that I am the Lord when I show myself holy among them. And I'm going to take you out of the nations and I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. That's the promise of restoration. But here's the really powerful part. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols, and I will give you a new heart wow. and put a new spirit in you, and I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit in you and move you 
to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. That's just an incredible promise of radical transformation yeah. that I think Je- Jesus would say to Nicodemus is what it means to be born again. Yeah, that is the new covenant, isn't it? That's tremendous. All right, we're going to take a little break. Pastor Andy Davis is my guest. We're in the book of Ezekiel, and when we come back, I'm going to ask him about the Valley of Dry Bones. That's all next. Well, I love every day opening God's Word, worshiping Him, studying His Word, and letting it speak to me. If you'd like to sign up for the Verse of the Day email, you can do that at myfaithradio.com, and you'll receive a daily Scripture graphic. I encourage you to do it. So glad to be with Pastor Dr. Andy Davis today. We're in the book of Ezekiel, and he is uh, giving us a lot of amazing insight to this book. And if you've missed any of this and you are an Old Testament uh, student, you're going to love this. So let, let's get to a more, I think, probably one of the more famous chapters. It was 37 that talks about the Valley of Dry Bones. So, Andy, mm-hmm. how, how does this chapter picture both the final restoration of Israel and individual resurrection from the dead. Yeah, I think it's in context. It's definitely talking about the restoration of the nation of Israel and their hopes. Um, And it's pictured as a a valley of dry bones, like skeletons, like there was this big battle years ago, and the bones are very dry, um, we're told. And uh, God asked the prophet, son of man, can these bones live? And he said... (laughs) Uh, he kind of punted. He said, oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. I was like, how can I know if they could ever live again? Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Wow. <laughs> and so it's just very powerful because it, it everything begins with the preaching of the word to the bones. And we're told in the New Testament that all of us, apart from Christ, if we're not yet Christians, we are dead in our transgressions and sins. So spiritually, we're like that valley of dry bones. We have no life in us. Mm -hmm. But when the Word of God is preached and the Spirit moves, and what happens in the chapter is the bones, once Ezekiel starts prophesying as he was commanded, the bones assemble themselves, all of them in the proper order, and then tendons and flesh come and skin, but there's no life in them. They're still not alive. They're just standing there. And then he's told to prophesy again to the four winds, and the four winds come, and it represents the the ministry of the Spirit. And then Spirit comes in them, and the breath comes in them, and they live. And that is represented in context as the hopes of Israel for restoration in their own promised land, and that will come. But it's also a much more significant prophecy of individual, personal resurrection from the dead. Jesus said very plainly in John chapter 5, the day is coming when all who are in their graves will hear Jesus's voice and come out. Um, And he says, those who have done right, those who are righteous through faith in Christ will come out to live. Also, 1 Corinthians 15 gives a very clear prediction of the resurrection of uh, body. And so we're going to experience this. This is one of the few pictures in the Old Testament of bodily resurrection from the dead. Mm, So good. All right, Andy, this next question, just because we're starting to run a little bit out of time, I'm going to take a block yep. of chapters and and ask yep. you about Ezekiel's mysterious temple. We learn about that from chapter 40 to 48. And I, my question is, why is this section so difficult to interpret? Well, it's a, it's a very detailed, meticulous, um, measured-out prophecy of a temple— and the center of the temple is animal sacrifice. There's no doubt about it. It's in the old covenant system. And remember that Ezekiel was a priest. And yet it never got built. No temple like that has ever been made. The temple built in Haggai was much smaller than Solomon's temple. It was not like this temple that is described in Ezekiel 40 to 48. Some Christians believe this is representing a millennial temple that will be rebuilt after the second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. I find that extremely problematic because the book of Hebrews says animal sacrifice is obsolete. Obsolete means it'll never be done again. So what would the purpose of animal sacrifice be when Jesus is physically reigning in Jerusalem as king? Makes no sense to me at all. So what it is, I don't really know. Others I know will disagree, but that's what makes it challenging. Okay, let's look at Ezekiel 47 and 48. 
Um, and yeah. does this give us a foretaste of the the heavenly glory of the New Jerusalem? Is that yeah, the absolutely. purpose of this? Okay. It may be. It may be that 40 to 48 is, again, as the temple, the, the tabernacle and temple were both shadows of a heavenly reality. So also the entire temple system points to Christ and then ultimately to the new Jerusalem. So uh, I, I, he's got all of these courts and, and courts that are measured and all that, but then uh, the land is divided up. And But there's this very, very interesting uh, picture in 47. He says, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple, and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. The water was coming down from un, uh, the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me through the north gate and led me around to the outside of the outer gate facing east, and the water was flowing from the south side. Mm. And as the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand, led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross. It had risen, was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. And then later in that same chapter, he says, fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. And every month they will bear because the water from the sanctuary flows to them and their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. Well, this exact image is picked up in Revelation 22, 1 through 5. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nation. Sounds exactly like what Ezekiel predicted. Well, it sure does. And so as I think about that, the consummating glory of the entire book of Ezekiel began with the glory of God in that incredible image in chapter 1. But the final verse in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 48, 35, speaks about that city. And the name of the city from that time on will be, the Lord is there. <laughs> and the prediction in Revelation 22 is, we, the servants of God, will be around his throne and we will see his face. And God will be with them and be their God and we will be together forever. I have to say, Andy, that's really exciting. Yeah. And I love the description it's... of the fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both sides of the river. Their leaves will not wither nor will their fruit fail every month they will bear. That's just outstanding. Yeah, that's beautiful. So that's some, but I, I think I'm okay with there being some mystery, some aspect of 48 chapters of Ezekiel that I'm scratching my head and say, <laughs> I just, uh, it's complex. Yeah. Question came in uh, during the show. Can you discuss what it means to hurt God? Like it, it's, uh, I think the reference was um, Ezekiel chapter six, verse nine. Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, God in his in himself cannot be uh, affected or touched by his creation. He's right. infinitely above it. But but in his compassion, uh, he cares about us in our pain, and he feels he feels that. And second of all, in his jealous love like a husband, we hurt God by our our kind of spiritual adultery. It brings pain to him because he has linked his heart with ours. And so that's what I think it means to hurt God. Mm-hmm. Andy, anything we can talk about in the remaining minute that you've got, uh, you're working on? Is, is there any project that you've got uh, going Absolutely. that you'd like to share? Yeah, please. Absolutely. This this summer, I'm working on a book uh, based on Job, and I've been on your show before talking about Job and suffering. Yes. So I have a contract due September 15th, and I'm just w uh, working through it. And it's been just a magnificent uh, study. Uh, it's It's timely, sadly. Uh, because there's so much hurting and pain and suffering in the world. And there's a chance for me to point toward the truths that come from Job and ultimately from Christ on the issue of suffering. So I'm working on writing that. But it's, Bill, it is a challenge to write a book. Someone likened it, and what do we men know, but like giving birth to a child. I mean, I, I right. obviously as men, we don't know what that's like, but it, there's a laboring over phrases and over sentences and words, and that's what I'm trying to do this summer. Yeah, you're one of the hardest working guys I know. Do you sleep more than two hours a night? I do. I do. <laughs> I want you to know how much I enjoy talking to you. I think we always talk about great things, and you know, you're a great host. I enjoy your show well, very much. Thank you so much. I, I go to twojourneys.org every week. There's always a reason I'm going there, and your teaching is superb, and 
Um, it's a fantastic website. So twojourneys.org. I just That's want good. to encourage everyone to go take a look. Andy, thank you once again for being here and have a great rest of the day. It's my pleasure. You, you too. Thank you so much. Pastor Andy Davis has been my guest. We talked about Ezekiel the whole hour. We're going to take a break, and I am so uh, glad that I'm looking forward to Dr. David Clark being in studio. We're going to talk about John chapter 15. That's all next. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.